ほらルフィ今一緒に海賊になる仲間を探してるんだハロー guys welcome to my channel the wandering zoro your go to destination for anime related content and if you're new here Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications so you never miss out on our latest videos. In today's video, we're going to be diving into part two of the series What If Deku Returns from One Piece World? So be sure to stick around until the end, and let's get started. Opening his eyes after a long and tiring sleep, Izuku stretched himself surprised by how comfortable this prior sleep was for him. He was on his bed after years of just sleeping in some hay or ending up on top of someone as blame of Luffy going crazy on his sleep. He felt weird. Three years used to getting his but handed to a sleeping Luffy and sometimes Zoro and now none of this was happening for once so it was just weird for him. He quickly gets up his bed and decides to quickly take a shower to get ready for this new day back at UA. He puts on his usual clothes on which is his pirate clothes. This is usually the only clothes he wears, even though he has some other clothes he can wear, but nothing is as comfortable or safe as this clothes he's wearing at the moment. He puts on his stuff and quickly checks on the Viva card of Yamato to find it all in a great condition. After putting it back on the bag and fixing his swords in place, Izuku grabs the duffel bag and makes his way to the living room, knowing that it being a Saturday, most, even Ida, are still resting. His sleep schedule is simply not the same, especially since Jaya and Bellamy's humiliation, which he wanted to do, but luckily, his captain, being the most amazing person out there, did it for him. Once downstairs, Izuka looks around, seeing the dorms quite surprised. He expected them to be a comfy place, but they feel like a room that was ripped out of a place like Mary Geos or Dress Rasa with how big it felt. Obviously, the size wasn't much for Izuku, for he had seen buildings where the beds were just as big as this entire building, and it's whales that equaled the entire campus. Izuku takes out the notebook with a lock on it as he sees some buttons to press. This being ancient writing like that of the Ponglies he saw in his past adventures with him, only learning some of it, but only the ones he needs to open up the notebook. This being one that translates to nothing more than Nika. After opening the book and going to some of the deeper pages, He sees some of the many recipes that the greatest chef he has ever met came up with for him to do, and even some that make him feel even more at home, like a yakitori made of seagull. Definitely not made after a seagull almost killed them all. No, I'm serious. Please believe me. Seeing the recipes, Izuku quickly starts to look for the stuff he needs to make this possible while looking at the duffel bag in front of him. Two outstanding things were those fruits he had plans for, but didn't know when was the appropriate time to do it, especially after seeing how heartbroken he had left Hatsum with his death. Some minutes later, Bakugo found himself going down the stairs at the moment. Sleeping well is something, and sleeping like never before is even better. He truly felt refreshed after his talks with both Izuku and Moria Day earlier, and he really didn't need much more to know how to start anew, but at the moment, something got his attention, and it was the smell of cooking. Getting even more his attention as he knows the only good cookers in this class of heroes only Sato, Momo, Shoji, and him know how to cook good, but Sato and Shoji don't like to wake up this soon in the morning, and Momo only cooks on school days, not the weekends. He quickly makes his way down the stair due to how good it s m e l l It wasn't something godlike, but it wasn't terrible too. It was at least the smell of something made to enjoy and say the thanks to the chef for their doings, and maybe even bow to them for it. He finally makes his way down the stairs to notice the duffel bag he saw yesterday with Izuku, letting him know it was Izuku, the one who was cooking. The one who has his ups and lows on cooking, but is mostly UPS. Only problem he remembers with Izuku's cookings is that at times he passes a bit too much with the condiments, even when the food looks to be the most gourmet ever. But who is to blame him? He was one with a shaky hand, especially after breaking his arms so much. Entering the kitchen, he's met by the sighting of Izuku. Cooking everything with ease while using some sort of black tendrils to move around the pans as he continues cutting in quick fashion the food. Bakugo, what the? Izuku, ah. He screams as he throws the pans to the air. Bakugo sees this and quickly moves in to grab one of them as Izuku quickly grabs the furthest one using his tendrils. Bakugo, Jesus Christ nerd, what is that all about? Izuku, s sorry, but I was in the zone while cooking. I didn't expect you to appear. s He and Bakugo put the pans back on the fire as he continues cooking, so how's the morning? Bakugo. Pretty good for the moment, but what were those tendrils thing? 
he says as he looks at Izuku still cooking while looking at the duffel bag from afar. Izuku. Oh those. During my time in that other world, I learned my power being a stockpile doesn't limit itself to one sort of output. The power itself deformed onto this black mass that assisted me on saving a friend from drowning. I had issues controlling it but by the end it was a major success. Bakugo. Heh. So that's how it is. Izuku. Yeah. I don't know what more to tell you without spoiling the fun of my stories. Bakugo. You really want us to hear these stories of yours? Any reason why? Izuku. Simple. Because that way you all with understand how cool my nakamas are. He says smiling. Bakugo. Includes that Yamato girl? Izuku. Yes, of course. He says smiling while blushing a bit. Can you go get class 1B? I'm making enough breakfast for everyone. Oh, and hats him too. Bakugo. Aye, aye, Captain. He says with a snarky tone present, only making Izuku rolls his eyes as he continues cooking Y grids though. Izuku. I owe her a proper explanation of where I went. I just came to see her, and she cried on my shoulder until she fell asleep so power loader made me drop her in the bed he is inside the workshop in case of this scenarios. Bakugo. Man's really expecting anyone to drop dead after crying EY? Izuku. Well one never know right? Bakugo. Hee <laughs> hee. Yeah, one never knows. I'll be back in a while, and you better tell me if they live up to the hype you build about your crew Izuku. He says as he starts to walk away towards the class 1B dorms knowing he then has to go to the workshop. Izuku. I promise you, they will break that hype. The minutes flew by and Bakugo quickly went to talk to both class 1B about it, and even Hatsum and made his way back. The class at this point was waking up as Izuku served as much breakfast as possible for both classes, and him whose appetite is quite big and certain rubber man is to blame. Class 1B was now making their way to the dorms of Class 1A in Calm, as they also spot Bakugo making their way to the entrance after talking to Hatsum who said she was gonna shower. Unnecessary info in his eyes, but understandable. He opens the door as the smell of the food has only grown better, only making him smirk realizing this part three years and nine months of Izuka's lives have not just been him going on a parole and becoming stronger. Everyone in class 1B gets this smell as they all have a shocked face from that smell. Kendo. Is like, the smell of the heavens. Bakugo. I mean it smells good and is not the best, but I guess that's what happens when your chef is someone like copy pasta over there. He says, pissing off Manoma. Class 1B. Agreed. Manoma's cooking pride was completely shot down by this words. Kirishima. Who was in the kitchen? Bakugo, did you finally feel like cooking? He says. Coming down the stairs with some of his classmates. Bakugo. I'm not cooking after the camp until Four Eyes properly apologizes for spilling my chili I was gonna put on the curry. Ida. But Bakugo. Putting chili on it was a bad idea. He says throwing his iconic hand chops. Bakugo, curse you four eyes. Chili makes curry better. Izuku, a sweat drop appeared on his forehead. At least they didn't change that much in this past four months. Can you all calm down and sit down? I'm gonna start serving the food in just a second. Bakugo, TCH, fine. He says as he starts to walk towards the table, as everyone looks at Bakugo surprised from his nonchalant reaction to seeing Izuku again who comes out of the kitchen with some big plates with food. Izuku. Okay, what are you all waiting? This food gets cold and is bad news for all of you. I learned to not waste food so either move it or I'm eating everything myself. Almost not thinking about it twice. The hungry students of both classes quickly moved in to sat down in the different tables and seats across the living room and dining room do there only being one table and not big enough for all 40 students present at the moment. Everyone started to serve themselves some food as they started to eat this amazing food made by Izuku D. Midoriya himself. Kendo. Oh, your cooking is amazing, Midoriya. She says eating some more food. Ida. You sure learned a lot in this new place you wear at. Not stopping eating as he enjoys the food. Kirishima. You cook almost as good as Bakugo, if not better. Bakugo. The F is with you and my cooking weirdy hair. He says as he bites onto some spicy curry to start the morning with the Bakugo style. Izuku. Well I learned from the literal best. I do not match him at all. I'm insanely far from his cooking I feast on back there. 
He says as he started to drool a bit remembering the first time he ate Sanji's cooking before snapping out of it and taking a bite out of his own food as his taste buds only told him this was mediocre due to what they were used. Eurarika. I can't imagine something better than this, but if you say is possible. Man do I hope I get to eat it one day. She says taking the bite out of her food and still continuing their day with ease. As they all talk. A sudden knock on the door calls the attentions of those not lost on the thought of the food they were eating as Monoma was still unconscious after almost dropping food to the ground accidentally. Izuku goes to open the door just to be surprised by the sighting. Not only was Hatsum here but most teachers and Tsukachi were behind her as she just stood there smiling while looking at Izuku before hugging him again. This was a way for her to check if reality wasn't playing mind games with her and to what she felt. To her likeness this wasn't the case at all as Izuko hugged her back with one arm. Hatsum. Sorry. It's just still so hard to believe. Izuko. Shishishishi. Don't think everyone thought I was alive that easily yesterday. Hatsum. What's with that laugh Midoriya? Izuku. There's a lot to it and I will explain you while we eat okay. He looks at the teachers behind her. Are all here to hear the stories aren't you all? Am. I mean... I kind of want to hear them since yesterday, so if you don't mind. Izuku. Is okay. I think there's even breakfast for all of you. Aizawa. There's coffee? Izuku. Y-E-S. Aizawa. G-O-O-D. After a while, everyone found themselves eating and living their lives talking to each other, and even getting on to some of the talk someone wanted them budging into, but they still did so deal with it. They were also enjoying their food as Hatsum was being told the what had happened to her friend during this past four months of their lives, and how time worked differently for him over there, and much more without obviously spoiling the fun for the stories as much as possible, and just like everyone else. She had to remind him that the places and people he knows are only known by him. Izuku and Bakugo were at the moment washing the dishes while the other one cleaned them just doing this silently, while the rest was just talking to each other. Tsukachi I think is about time we get started with this stories. Am. Let them finish wash the dishes and then we can get started. Monoma. What is this notebook all about? He says looking at Izuku's notebook with the Ponglyph lock on it as he tries to open it but fails. Ida. Monoma is for the better if you don't open that from Midoriya. Monoma. Why should I listen to a prick like you whose brother can't be much now? Ida. He only flinches listening to that as his eyes darken. There will be a day I let loose and your head will be the first thing I cave into a wall Nido Monoma. Always have that in mind. Shoto. He whispers on Ida's ear Ida now is not the time to commit attempted murder yet again. Shoto suddenly feels someone touch his shoulder making him turn to who it was just to see Monoma standing right in front of him still holding the notebook as he freezes it to the complete shock of both Ida and Shoto before slamming it into the ground shattering the ice and scaring everyone for a second before seeing what was happening. I love making prick characters and you are all lucky I decided to not go the Momo route like I wanted cause I would make you hate her even after finishing this story. Monoma goes to pick up the book and look at it noticing something. It did not budge at all. Monoma, what the? Izuku. The lock was made with Wapa metal, one of the most resistant metals in that other world. So much so it can tank insane heats and is the same material that makes a huge part of the crew's inventor machinery, and if almost nothing broke him back at Wano when facing two Yonkos that make All Might and All for One fighting look like a game for little kids, don't think the pathetic use of Shoto's quirk will be enough to destroy it. He says as he picks up the notebook, and in such speed that barely anyone could keep up, unlocks it to quickly check if all pages are okay. Bakugo. He just sits down while looking at Izuku so. Gonna start, or gonna just leave us here waiting? Izuku. Sorry but in this notebook there's a lot of stuff I wrote down across the years. Can't let it all go to waste for the stupidity of someone who reminds me too much of the family of a Nakama. He says still looking throughout all the pages before stopping and closing it. A.M. I'm not the only one excited, am I? Nizu. In all honesty, no. Most teachers were kind of like little kids right now, ready to be told this story about their grandfather of how he once was when your father or mother was younger. This clearly wasn't the case as this was someone way younger, but someone who explored a completely new world no one knows much about. The students were no different as they looked at Izuku wondering what he was about to tell them, and what was his life like back at that other world he got so used to that he has some struggles here but not too many. 
They were all pretty close and sitting down while turning to Izuku who reaches out for his duffel bag and pulls out a box as he opens it. Izuku. I think it's fair to say there is only one way to start all of this in all fairness. That would be one of the many reasons we were chased like we were back at Jaya and Skypea. Ida. What would that be? Izuku. Simple. The bounties of the straw hats. Starting with the lowest. He clears his voice as he shows one of them Tony Tony Chopper. Crew medic. 300 million belly. Mina. He looks so cute. Hagakure. I want to hug him. Pony. What is he exactly? She says looking at the picture of Chopper confused. Chopper is a reindeer who ate the Hito Hito no Mi. A devil fruit that gave him human thinking. A.M. Devil fruit. We'll explain after one. Next one is. He pulls out another one cat burglar Nami. Ship navigator. 400 million bellis. Mineta. Look at her. Kaminari. What a woman. Eurarika. Her body actually reminds me of Hatsum. Hatsum. I mean, I kinda see it. Kaminari, Mineta. Stop sounding like hungry wolves before I pummel all of you. He says glaring at them. Mineta slash Kaminari. H. Hi. We now have. He grabs another poster soul Kingbrook. Muxician and fighter of the crew. 420 million bellis. Everyone. He looks like All Might. Whatever heroic pride was left on All Might cracked and vanished as Izuku only chuckles. Next we have. He reaches out for the next one. Iron Man Frankie. Shipwright and inventor of the crew. 440 million bellis. Power loader. He looks like a cyborg. Tetsu Tetsu. He actually does. It's because he is. What? Is a pirate world? Yes, but it is insanely advanced still. Next up. He pulls out the next bounty god Usup. Crew sniper. 560 million bellis. Recovery girl. Why does he look like he's dying? M. A lot about it that is hard to believe. Midnight. What kind of insane things do you have deal with for someone to get like that? Too much he clears his throat as he grabs the next bounty from here on the increase is gonna be a lot. The previously mentioned couldn't fully participate in Elbaf like this next ones did. First son of the sea Jean Bay. Ex-warlord of the sea and the second father figure of the straw hats. 1 billion 347 million bellis. Momo. A billion. Kurwaro. Now the numbers are getting ridiculous. Jeez. Tokoyami. I didn't expect to be that much. Nizu. He has some fish-like features. Why is that? It has to do with him being a fishman, one of the many races in the world, and one that has been heavily discriminated. A.M. One of the harsh truths you told me about, right? Hi. Now this next one. He grabs one of the last posters remaining Oni Princess Yamato. Daughter of the Emperor of the Sea Kaido and Second Coming of Odin. 2 billion 50 million bellis. Bakugo. So that's her, huh? He says smirking. A.M. I may sound weird, but I must say you are a lucky one, young Midoriya. T. Thanks. He says looking away with a blush while certain girls look at him. Hatsum. What does that mean? Kindo. I also want to know that. Don't worry about it for now. He goes to grab one of the five remaining. Mineta. I mean she ain't that bad looking. Kaminari. Agree. Now how badly do you want me to kill you all? He says glaring coldly at them making them shut up. This one is where we start to get ridiculous. But it is all worth. He shows them the bounty vin smoke Sanji. Chef of the crew and master of the black leg technique. 4,563,000,000 bellis. Midnight. Well he's a good looking. She says in that of a tempting tone. Setsuna. Not that bad looking in all honesty. Mina. Well, not only women look good, but men even more. He would be flying off right now from a nosebleed. He thinks with a sweat drop. Now for the third highest. He shows them King of Hell Roranoa Zoro. World's greatest swordsman. Right-hand man and first member. 4,563,000,000 bellis. Kirishima. He's got more scars than Midoriya. He has gone throttle lot in all honesty. Present Mike. I just realized that the last two only have some numbers of difference. Yeah. The best part is that both are super competitive between each other so when this bounty went up they almost kicked each other for hours due to it. He says chuckling while looking away with a sweat drop. 
Ciro, friendly rivalry. Couldn't be said better. Now this one is more of a special case, and I will explain it afterwards. He says as he pulls out one of the last three devil child Nico Robin, archaeologist of the Straw Hats and only survivor of O'Hara. 5 billion 23 million Bellis. Mineta. Another ho dash. Suddenly passes out. I'm not dealing with him. Now, the reason I said she's a special case because she survived the destruction of the country of O'Hara at the hands of the Marines, due to her being the only one capable of translating something known as Poneglyphs which narrated an entire lost century of history and the only way to the One Piece. Her bounty was high since she was young. To put her bounty, she had a 79 million belly bounty when she was only 8. A.M. Is that how much they wanted her dead? Yeah. Her bounty only increased when she joined the Straw Hats. Momo. But what kind of thing was in those Poneglyphs to want an entire country dead? There were many horrifying acts committed. So many atrocities brought by the world government themselves. Only trying to learn a single bit of it is enough to give you a dead sentence. 13. That's horrifying to hear. Now, the highest bounty. Aizawa. Problem child. Did you not have a bounty? Oh that. Well I was saving mine for the end but if you guys want me to, then okay. He says as he grabs the second to last bounty. Now here. Is mine. He shows it to everyone shocking them lightning night Deku. Strategist of the straw hats, meaning my plans don't really matter by the end. 4 billion, 385 million bellis. Everyone. What? Aizawa. Almost at the level of those two. AM. From what you told me I knew you would have a high one but this numbers are. Ridiculous. Eurarica. That makes you the fifth highest bounty. Shishishishishi. Ida. But why Lightning Knight? Is mostly because of Alabasta and me protecting Vivi, a princess, from getting killed by an ex-warlord who had taken over her country. It was kind of the same with the rest, but I am the one who took one of the most fatal blows. He says as he lifts his shirt revealing a huge scar across his abs that makes All Might go and grab his own injury in shock from the scar-only chest scars. Daz Bones better known as Mr. One tried to stab Vivi, but I stepped in with enough time to be stabbed on the waist for it to go almost cut my large intestine and my ribs, but luckily I was able to break the blade. Not only that, but I also got the scar in my neck due to him on the attempt of killing me off, but luckily Zoro was able to get him away from me to fight him off. Thanks to that I was able to get her to stop the rebel army for the time being, but it wasn't enough. Using my injuries to his advantage, the ex-warlord threw me to the crowd to trigger the army on to continue their war. The bounty was given the moment I appeared out of thin air and crashed a barrel of water onto Crocodile's face before kicking him towards Luffy. Ida. Jesus. As I said, there was a lot to it. He says as he pulls out the final bounty of the straw hats as it brings a wide smile to his face and he shows it to everyone whose faces are filled with even more shock than before. Their eyes almost shoot out from said shock as they hold in the need to scream. Straw Hat Monkey D. Luffy. Captain of the Straw Hat Pirates and wielder of the most ridiculous power ever. 6,565,000,000 Bellis. Everyone. In Nanny? A.M. That much for one singular person? Momo. Itch how much would that be in our currency? Izuku. M. Well Bellis are yens. Siro. So wait. His head is worth that much but in yens? Izuku. Yeah and if. One converts it into dollars. Nizu. It would be $53 million for one person's head. He screams in pure shock. Everyone just looks at Nizu even more shocked as they scream EH. Izuku could only laugh as he sees their reactions and how panicked they were about this sudden reveal that not only is Izuku's head worth more than a pro hero's salary and four years of tax evasion is committed, but still, it was insane to think what they were able to do and that such numbers are on their heads. Izuku found himself seeing his classmates and teachers still in shock from the recent discovery of their fellow cinnamon roll, having a bounty for defeating God knows how many people he has beaten in this last three years and nine months, but his captain? It was outright mind-blowing to them, his bounty being the highest and most insane of them all. Izuku. And that is the bounties of the Straw Hat Pirates he says as he starts to roll them all back in place with ease still keeping a proud smile. Ida. This is... amazing. Juzo. 
I never expected to see something like this, but, wow. Hatsum, could we get an answer about those Yamato comments from All Might and Bomberman? Izuku's smile stays there, but it now has a bit of a weary feeling on it. Kendo, I also want to know a bit about it. It raised some questions for me. Izuku's smile is still present as he sweats a bit more and more as All Might and Bakugo don't know what to say about it. They definitely said more than they should have and now Izuku's head may actually be claimed by someone after three years. Izuku, uh? How does one explain this situation? Is impossible actually, I just have to be blatant. The word came out and the shock was overwhelming and drowning. Everyone's eyes went blank expect for the three who already knew as it was almost unbelievable for them to hear this as all eyes were simply set on the greenied, who just stood there both embarrassed and happy, while looking all over the place only staring at his friends, classmates and teachers who can't seem to process the information. Kendo. So, you're a father? Izuku. I will be in what is about two weeks and a half in this world, but in reality is in about seven months. He says still looking away embarrassed while scratching the back of his head at neck breaking speed. Hatsum. I. See. She says just looking at Izuku silently or well, just staring at him. Everyone just continues looking at Izuku silently not knowing what to say anymore due to the shock, and if it wasn't because he ran Mineta unconscious, he would be screaming some stuff that would have ended with him being knocked down unconscious. A.M. So, about the devil fruit thing you mentioned earlier young Midoriya, Izuku, what about them? A.M. Well none of us know about it, could you explain us a bit? Izuku, sure. I actually have something because I wanted to do it with the help of Hatsum related to the devil fruits. This perks up Hatsum who almost kicks aside what she was told about Izuka being a father now to focus on this new topic. Everyone else kind of does the same as they remember he mentioned it, and it kind of interests them a little lot. Izuku. So, devil fruits. They fruits scattered across the world that once eaten give those who ate it a power that is permanent until death but in change of this power. You lose the ability to swim, and you may say is not a lot, but when the world is 86% water, it truly is something to worry about. The fruits are separated in three categories. Paramecia which give the user a pretty rare and unique ability like that of making you create string from your body, make your body on Tamachi, and even altering anyone's age by touching them remembering the user of this devil fruit. Izuku shakes a bit. Urarika. Machi? She says as her eyes shine like stars. Tsuyu. Eurorica calm down. Zoan allow users to turn into animals and are divided in standards making one into animals you can find nowadays even humans. One of them being the Hido Hido no Chopper 8. Ancient letting one turn into extinct animals like dinosaurs and mythicals which are animals one mostly hear of in legends like a phoenix or a dragon. And Logia which are the rarest of them all which let the user turn into an element of sorts and by that I mean your body becomes untouchable. An example could be the Marine Admiral Kizaru who ate the Pika Pika Nomi turning his body into pure light, he is able to teleport via reflections, and even shoot lasers, so powerful they are capable of destroying all of UA in one blow. There are weaknesses, and as priorly mentioned there is the definitive weakness of water. Once more than half of your body, from the belly button and up, is inside of water. You literally lock yourself, Luffy explained it as being filled with a sack of cement, and turning into stone as you only stay there desperate as you continue falling. Not only that but after encountering a marine soldier known as Smoker, I was presented with the second weakness of Devil Fruit users, Sea Stone. His weapon jit is made of this mineral capable of negating the usage of Devil Fruits and unless the user is strong enough, you will most likely not see him moving around while cuffs made out of it are being worn. In our terms, imagine Quirk cancelling cuffs with a poison that slowly exhausts one's body until they can't move anymore and pass out. Everyone was at awe to what they were hearing at the moment. This powers were almost limitless to what they were able to hear, and it didn't seem to be limited to anything other than how much the user was willing to push them almost making Quirk seem like a laughing stock. Cause they kinda are compared to devil fruits. Mina, did you eat one? Izuku, nope, but that does make me bring up something else. He says as he reaches out for the duffel bag and opens it up again to put inside the box with all the bounties, devil fruits as I said before, don't only limit themselves to affecting humans. The Hido Hido Nomi, for example, made Chopper think and act like a human even though he was a normal reindeer before eating it. So what do you think can happen to other things? No one really knew what to answer as they thought of it for a whole minute, but couldn't think of anything. 
Well, I'll answer, I guess. A very known doctor from that world, Dr. Vegapunk, discovered that inanimate objects can eat the devil fruits when in reality what they do is infuse the devil fruit into the object. He mostly did it with Zoan due to them having consciousness of their own, but when we got to meet him, me and the crew learned that it's easier with Zoans to do this, but it can also be possible with others. Problem is that it can take an insanely long time to do so, and by that I mean it can take weeks when with Zoans it takes 12 hours, that is the why. He pulls out two fruits from his duffel bag while looking at them with a small smirk. I plan on giving a good use to this too. Kanoko. One looks like a pear and the other one. Aoyama. A diamond. He says as everyone looks a bit weird except those who aren't dumb enough to not realize what he meant, I mean diamond. Sorry for the French. This are the Kira Kira no Mi. Let's the user turn his body into diamond that not even the world's strongest swordsman who I witness cut what equals a Mount Everest in one slash could shatter with what he claimed to be the strongest slash in the world. He says looking at the diamond one, and this one, is the Gura Gura no Mi, said to be the strongest paramecia and claimed to have the power to destroy the world via creating massive shockwaves that will travel throughout almost anything and be felt on every corner of the world. He says as he suddenly shows a picture more shocking than anything else for everyone. This is what this fruit is capable of, and while I have it mostly here for the sake of no one laying a finger on it and using it for evil yet again. Power loader. So why give it a use? Because for the first time in my life, I don't want to just defeat someone. I want to send all for one to hell knowing what he truly is. Aizawa. And what is that exactly? That he's nothing but a piece of dust. PM. You are sounding to Adamant on beating him. Why would that be? I'm done with letting someone like him who is pure evil just go around living their life. That world showed me what happens when you let it be the case if you don't do anything before time. The Void Century, the World Government, the Gorosei, the Celestial Dragons, Blackbeard himself. If I let someone like All for One go around, the world is done for and if I were to die, I would love to die I did whatever was necessary to live a life where they can smile in peace. I don't need to be praised for my achievements, have a statue on my name, or be remembered in history for eternity. All I want to do is assure the world that they can live in peace with no worries. A world where everyone can feel free to be and enjoy it all. But of course, that isn't my only dream. I also share one dream with my captain. One that can be seen as childish, but is the best of the best. Nizu. What is it? Izuku only continues smiling while thinking of his dream and what he wants to do at the moment to make it come true. While this dream happens, he can leave this world in peace and maybe retire to live his life with Yamato and his future child where he can be in complete peace as at the moment. He prepares himself to speak up. I. The squacking noise of the birds comes in with the wind as both classes present. The teachers and Hatsum only stare at Izuku in shock and surprise as some try to not laugh about it. Nizu. That sure is a childish dream, Midoriya. He says looking at Izuku who doesn't stop smiling. I know but I can't help but feel like I have to make it come true. Bakugo, he laughs a bit, you sure grew, but you can still be the most childish of them all at times. Ahahaha, am. I respect that dream, young Midoriya. He says smiling at his successor. Eurarika, same over here, Dekakuin. Hatsum, I 100% am in to help you on it. She says looking at Izuku. Izuku only smiles hearing this as some slowly start to laugh, but he doesn't mind at all. Oh yeah, Nizu. I have a question for you. Nizu. Oh, what would that be? Well, you see, there are some friends of mine that are not from UA, and I wanted to ask you if there was a chance they could come in to hear about my stories because they really wanted to yesterday when they heard of them. Mina. Other people already knew? How many people knew this before you even got to appear in front of us? Bakugo. I did. He says as he cleans off some tears and taking a sip from his water bottle. Kaminari. Really? Bakugo knew, but we didn't? Shoto, Kaminari, look at me and listen to me. He says making Kaminari turn to him, I don't think that Midoriya would have even come to you first and I'm pretty sure he just sees you as his classmate. Kaminari. Okay, no need to be so rough with me, you know? Dash. Nizu, now Midoriya, I know you just shared a such thing with us and told us a bit about you and your crew, but I have this to ask you as well. What is it, sir? Nizu. How does an exhibition match or matches sound for you? Izuku hearing this at first has a surprised look while looking at Nizu in front of him. 
is kind of hard to process it, but all other students and teachers look at Nizu surprised by this request of his. Yes, they wondered just how much has Izuku grown in this past three years of his life and would like answers, but they don't know exactly how to take this in. That exact moment is when a smirk slowly forms on Izuku's face before turning itself into a smile while looking at the people in front of him who only stare at him a bit surprised. He quickly takes out Ace from its sheath to then put it in his shoulder as his smile is still present while looking at everyone else before his eyes suddenly change colors to a grayish color with red lightning coming out of him before it coats his sword as his determination flows. Ixir, you tell me? How much fun would I get out of this fight? The classes were now making their way to the observation room with their teachers behind them, all of them discussing of different stuff like the fights that Izuka must have been trapped on, some wondering what kind of devil fruits there may be out there and how they work while others wonder what kind of people was his crew like. Nizu found himself already there looking at the screens and checking all cameras while talking to someone else on the phone as he hears the door behind him open up revealing the previously mentioned people. Bakugo. He said elements so it may as well be anything. Kirishima. Yeah, but could you imagine something like ick ashes or even hard candy? Ida. I guess you could, but we ourselves don't understand it as much as he does, so we can only live with the doubts. Aizawa. A question did raise to me. What exactly caused the bounties of others? Like the cook of their crew. I get someone like Zoro due to him being a swordsman and even carrying the title of King of Hell, but what is it about their cook that got him that high apart from power? Sakachi. I was wondering exactly the same about him. Maybe his family heritage? Snipe. Yeah. Midoriya seemed to put a big emphasis on the Vince smoke. So maybe that's his family name and possibly groups of pirates. Niza. Well, it's interesting to see and hear all of your theories about this other world. After all, Midoriya is leaving us in the shadows about many things and many others he doesn't seem to want to tell us. Things none of you shall attempt to make him spill, if he doesn't want to, is understandable. He knows what is right for us to know and what we shouldn't. Monoma. Why? It's just things from another world. Not like they matter in this one at all. Vlad. Monoma quiet, that other world is filled of more secrets than anyone imagines or would expect it to have so if he doesn't want to spread stuff that people were massacred only because they accidentally found out, then don't force him to say it. Monoma. TCH. Why should I dash? Kendo suddenly punches him. Not smack him. Punches him hard enough his face is imprinted onto the wall. He crashed onto leaving everyone shocked. It seems like someone was done with his bullshit with all rights of the world to do so. Kendo. Nido Monoma. For once stop disrespecting anyone in your way and accept the fact people can be better than you. First you disrespected Midoriya's sacrifice for all might. Then make fun of his death in front everyone in his class and still dare to feel superior? I promise you that if you ever make fun of anyone from another class, gut punching you once won't be enough to put away my anger towards you. So either shut your trap or I will shatter your legs. Izuku from here could only feel the menacing aura escaping from Kendo. Clearly he didn't feel it killing him but as a woman's wrath, is still scary. Nevertheless this aura let out something. Familiar for Izuku leaving one thing in clear, he could start teaching those three in particular out of anyone in this class. But who knows, there may be a fourth one with it and knowing certain blonde, he most likely also has the color himself. He stretches a bit as the bones of his body crack while looking up front to this fake city upon him. He doesn't need much to know this place will be swarmed of enemies in a couple of minutes. If anything, it may even have some heroes that Nizu called in to fight this student that suddenly came back to life stronger than ever before. From the comms, he was able to hear how people were all hoping to see some action and wonder how things would go for Izuku in this matches. The questions were many and the desire for answers even more and Izuku. Well, he just wanted to have fun in a fight like never before. He remembers back at Mary Geos and how the duels over there were. He was living life to its fullest while fighting one of the last people between them and finally turning the world upside down. The smile he wore that day is one he's heavily proud of as that was a fun battle he will never forget, and he know the chance of it happening away is quite low. But hey, if he is able to enjoy himself on one, is all that matters to him. Kaminari, how do you think it will go? Momo, I don't fully know what way it could go. We don't know what kind of techinks Midoriya has and for all we know, Devil Fruits may be one of the many powers in that world. Everyone's eyes are suddenly focused in Momo L. Look, all I'm saying is that we shouldn't see it work the same way as ours, 
For all we know, devil fruits may be the most powerful, but there may be others. A.M.? It is a fair point, young Yairozu, but we just didn't expect you to suspect such thing. Momo. I mean, I saw it with the point the world is insanely vast from the little hints he told us, so what stops others from having other powers? Tsukachi. What a way to see it, Yairozu. I think all of them are going to be surprised when they see hockey in action. Nizu. All right, Midoriya. This fight will have two phases. I won't be saying much more about it, but be ready for both. Izuku. I understand Niz. Now question. You don't mind if I destroy this city, right? This simply makes everyone fall in silence. Did Izuku really just ask this so nonchalantly? Well, indeed he has and while he may not be used to doing this, but he knows one power of his that could flatten entire cities, so there's the worry and reason to the question. Nizu. Sure, go on. Samintas. You better pay me double if he does. He says looking at the rat. Nizu. I can't back out now. Well? We shall start very soon, Midoriya. Izuku. By soon you mean? Nizu, now. He says activating a bunch of robots. That's when Izuku's eyes shine red, letting out a ringing noise, while looking at the horde of villains in the distance, slowly making their way towards him while coming out of the ground as he is able to see incoming bullets, punches, and even missiles. A smile only came to Izuku as he reaches out for Ace and quickly pulls it out from his sheath while looking at the robots at the distance. Well, seems like I have some enemies to face EY, he says as a wide smile appears and he rushes towards the robot at a calmed pace before turning to the camera showing that he is ready to go off in a second play this on loop. This is fire. Today, I am having fun of my own. As this words left him, the floor beneath him cracks before turquoise lightning emanates from him, and his sword is coated in both red and turquoise lightning as a black color covers it turning it into a black blade infused with the color of the conqueror. Izuku suddenly disappears from any camera as all bullet and punches are rained towards the street he was last seen on standing as he appears once in a while, taunting the robot AI and dodging bullets with ease. Izuku suddenly appears behind a couple three-pointers when his entire rush can be seen by the destroyed Groudon left behind him before the, the three-pointers burst into pieces from Izuku's slashes who only turns to his eyes towards an incoming jab from a two-pointer, making him pull out Nidai Kitetsu and slashing the robot perfectly in half while also damaging the entire building behind it bringing down half of it. Izuku quickly start running towards the next robots as the world goes black for him and he can see a white outline of the incoming attack's danger since has warned him about making him dodge bullets as they start to rain upon him non-stop, but he doesn't budge as he cuts some down or parries them out of his way before putting Nidai Kitetsu back on its scabbard, and with one hand stop the incoming punch from one of the robots. A black substance covers his arm before it lets out a reddish aura that quickly flows onto the one-pointer and destroys its arm via emission, and use of its internal destruction, leading to the complete destruction of the robot before Izuku's danger sense warns him of incoming attack, only giving him the chance to coat his left arm in the black substance as he saves Ace on its Seetha before using his arms to parry all incoming attacks while moving at insane speeds, blocking every single bullet as he infuses himself with conquerors. He takes a leap towards the nearby machines, punching holes onto their chest, completely destroying their cores as he makes his way down the street destroying more and more of the robots, while he only smiles and laughs due to him being entertained in this combat. Hiroshima. Whoa. Kaminari. His actions are so amazing. Kendo. He has some sort of style but his actions are so quick we can barely notice it. Shoto. He's keeping himself low in power. He's not going all out for all we know. Ida. He said he wanted to have fun, right? Well, he's getting just that. Bakugo. That substance. Is not the same as those tendrils. The one of it was darker and it wasn't reflective. Not only that, but they had a green aura just like his quirk and this one is completely different. Then this means. His eyes turn a bit towards Momo Dash. She was right. Am. The way he uses hockey is amazing. Combining it with his swordsmanship and combat styles. He is almost impossible for him to be defeat by anyone weaker than him, and for anyone stronger he may give them issues with his mixed styles and spontaneous ways. Tsukachi. Definitely, he seems to be coating himself like he told us because his body is emanating the black lightning. A.M. To make even the smallest blow a kill shot. Everyone turns to both showing surprised faces about their words. 
Of course, no one knew what they were talking about, but it sounded to have huge relevance with Izuka's powers. So one genius decided to ask what everyone wants to know. Ida, what is hockey? Am. Oh right, he never explained it, did he? Bakugo, we're asking for a reason. He says looking at him with a deadpan look. Am. He he, good point. To what Izuku explained me and Tsukachi on our way to UA. Hockey is a manifestation of one's soul, will and desire turned into a weapon. One of the sharpest weapons this world can have. Capable of turning the weakest knife into a hard-to-break blade that can shatter stronger blades than it. Capable of making you aware of everyone around and using your will to make those around you kneel down to your knees. Hockey is divided on three different ways just like devil fruits. Armament hockey, which is the black substance covering young Midoriya's arm, which by the name alone should tell you what it does. He said that on a clash between armament hockey, the one who would come on top would be the strongest while the other one shatters, leaving the person unconscious. This one also has advanced ways to be used, which to what I understood of one of them, he is able to cause an inner implosion via flowing his hockey onto someone or something causing major damages. Kirishima. So my hardening in a way, but there is more dangers at facing someone who surpasses me in strength. Tetsu Tetsu. Is better to use it when you know someone is weaker than you, is better to not risk it. Observation hockey, which lets him sense the percents of someone, their strength, emotions, and even killing intent, just like armament and the next one. There is an advanced way of using it which lets one see into the future by seconds, or even longer than that. Mineta. You mean Midoriya can see into the future like Night Eye used to? That is correct. Him having hockey means he has a completely new quirk with a new set of abilities. Oh, and that is not the last one. There is still one more. Last one, said to be almost impossible to obtain and is a one in a million ability, but those who obtain it is because they have the spirit to stand above others. Young Midoriya first mentioned it as the color of the conqueror, but its right terminology is conqueror's hockey. Tsukachi. Apart from the rarest, it can also be said to be the strongest of the three mentioned. From Midoriya's crew, there is only four with who now I know are Roronoa Zoro who he mentioned as right-hand man to me. His Captain Monkey D, Luffy, Kazuki Yamato, and young Midoriya. This one causes an unbearable pressure that makes people pass out, lets them set a domination over the animals around him, and the previously mentioned pressure can be used to a point it starts to damage the environment, and to what he told me. It can be so much to some points the users are capable of splitting the skies and even islands. Everyone was looking at Tsukachi in shock and surprise making them remember that pressure they felt when he first got here. If he is able to make it so powerful they can pass out, it means he wasn't going all out when he showed it off and that pressure was already strong enough it felt like they were dying except for three of them. Bakugo didn't knew of this due to him, not being there at the moment, and going to drop both Mori and Mumei to their HQ. Of course it has an advanced way. And this one lets you infuse your body and even weapons with his conquering spirit boosting the weapons beyond their already high power. He told us the first time he used the infusion was in the country of Elbaf all by accident, while trying to win time for his crew to escape from a marine admiral chasing them down, and he felt the difference of power as it was more clear than never before. The entire class lived in shock while looking at Izuku who at this point was clearly messing around with the robots. Not only was he letting himself be punched throat buildings, Thing that Luffy's classic techniques of slamming people onto walls on a form of hello, and if you think is a lie you only have to ask Zoro about it, he knows it the better. Kendo found herself looking at every move of Izuku and how at times they seemed lazy but at the same time no. They had this lazy aspect to them due to the wind ups to throw this blows that shook the entire fake city in one go. She couldn't help but see his joy on his every movement and see how great and precise they were. Hatsum was not too different to seeing his every attack in action. It was clear this clothes were kind of made with the intent of fighting, so there was a huge chance he would not need a new hero costume for a while. But what about support gear? There may be some stuff he may need with his quirk to grow even stronger. Maybe make some stuff for the devil fruits. Maybe that's why he needs her help that she is 100% willing to give him. Nizu. Alright Midoriya. We're gonna start phase 2 of your exhibition fight. Izuku kicks the last few robots away destroying them before they even impact onto buildings. Izuku. What's next then? Nizu. Simple. He presses the button. As from the ground, some robots come out but they didn't look like normal robots or like those he fought before. This had a more humanoid form and reminded Izuku of one thing. Some heroes of this times. 
The robots in front of Izuku quickly rush at him, as it lets him identify this one robot is based on the hero that disappeared without saying anything, a clock, appears in front of Izuku raining many punches in the matter of seconds that he could only cover from thanks to armament, but it doesn't take away the fact he gained momentum to easily go throughout multiple buildings. The other robots who one was able to fight and was based of Captain Celebrity and the other one based on Best Genist, this two try to quickly take down Izuku by using strong fibers and punching him around but Izuku easily dodges all incoming attacks with such ease everyone could only look at this with little surprise, but the damages being caused by Thig robots is insane in the eyes of the heroes and students of UA. Izuku comes out of the debris calmly with just a single centimeter scratch from all the buildings he just went throt. This is not giving me good memories. They look too human for my liking. Not gonna fight them. When the hell did I say that? I was just reminded of the last time I properly broke an arm while using my power and that my opponent wasn't the one who broke it. He screams while looking at one of the cameras with an angry look. My problem is that it's just like a pacifista. Robots made by the marines to hunt us down with more ease. It took all of us to beat a single one of them before we took those two years, but afterwards they were nothing but cannon fodder. Momo. This marines really sound the actual bad guys. Aways. I was gonna ask why no one rebelled against them, but then remembered earlier when he told us about them making entire islands disappear for simple information. Nizu. We can stop the fight if you want Midoriya. I doubt this would be worse, but... Izuku suddenly takes off his collar and reaches out for the bag with Yamado's Vivra card as he puts it on his neck, replacing the place of his collar as the collar is put on his waist where the bag was. Everything around them starts to completely change. The pressure feels bigger and more powerful as Izuku once again grabs onto Ace. The ringing noise once again comes as Izuku's eyes shine red and his body is surrounded by black and turquoise lightnings as his power becomes almost inhuman with his pressure easily felt across all of the prefecture of Nagata. I guess I'll have to get serious for once. I can fully handle one for all at its 100%. Suedo 200% is at the moment its peak and combining it with Saru and infusing myself with conquerors I can go even faster. So I better beat them before my 2 minute limit kicks I in. Izuku lets his body start to drop forwards before taking another another step, bursting all of the nearby windows, and the floor onto shatters completely before Izuku disappears at insane speeds, while rushing towards the robots as all the students and heroes can see are the robots being sent around. Kendo. W.H. Ida. What monstrous speed. Shoto. I don't think even All Might can move that fast. A.M. I can barely follow him is like seeing lightning strikes happening every four seconds all over. The place. Izuku continues blitzing around landing strong punches on his opponents, yet not making them kill shots for some reason. There is more to this robots and Izuku can feel it. For them to gain this speeds and strengths, there must be something to this machines that have Izuku interested, and he will try and figure it out while fighting them. Using Ace, Izuku slashes the air using Divine Departure throwing a hackified, slash that cuts throughout the buildings in front of him completely bringing down the buildings and damaging the robots. But that's when Izuku realizes what was that got his attention so much. They were made of nanobots. This brings Izuku a smirk. The reason they can keep up with anyone is all because of nanomachines made to resist this high caliber power with ease as it reveals itself in seconds. But for Izuku, there is no problems. He suddenly appears in front of the captain celebrity robot as he lands a punch onto its waist. Remembering how this hero used to operate, he knows that his quirk is a powerful cover of telekinesis that makes him almost impossible to injure, but if there is a way to force him to stop using it, he will have to land punches filled of conquerors in this little time gap he has. On quick and bullet-like succession, Izuku starts to rain punches onto the robot's chest that slowly start to create huge gaps of nanomachines due to the usage of his quirk, conquerors infusion and advanced armament, as slowly the robot doesn't know what to do about this. He then uses his sword to slash upon its chest, breaking off some mechanisms before tightening his grip on Ace, while looking at the robots inside. Lightning sparks out of the blade as he impacts onto its chest and ends up appearing behind him before the robot explodes onto pieces. Thunder Bagua Izuku rushes in to fight the best genus robot, who he can guess has an excess of nanomachines on its body to make the similar thing to Genist using his control over fabrics, but he's snapped out of his thought when he feels the o'clock robot come in for a punch he easily counters breaking its arm. 
most power of a clock was on his legs due to movement, and even though his body moved as fast as the rest, his arms don't have any inhuman strength. Izuku goes along the street clashing against the robot, completely devastating the street and nearby buildings shocking everyone seeing this, but when they stop they simply witness the completely destroyed body of the o'clock robot before Izuku is finally capable of slashing its legs off and throwing a strong kick onto its face, destroying its head and collapsing the buildings behind the robot. With 30 seconds remaining for Izuku's form of his strongest powers mixed onto one, he rushes at full speed across the city causing insane levels of destruction as the robot starts to try and slash him down using its fabrics as it destroys many more sections of the city, Izuku easily keeping up against it as he slashes all coming fabrics from best genist. That's when Izuku decides to reach out for his second sword, Nidai Kitetsu, as he rushes towards towards the robot with the purpose of killing it in one attack. Using any nearby Bibri to bounce around and easily duel it against this robot in front of him. Everyone sees Izuku's smile while coming towards the robot as he gets both swords in position to do one slash. Odin Notoriu. His aura suddenly consumes itself onto one spot as Izuku bullets towards the robot that tries over and over again to slash him in half, but he doesn't stop. His eyes simply shine as he's coated on a reddish and turquoise aura as everything below him cracks. The teachers noticing this, decide to hang onto their students knowing that this attack will pack an insane power. Paradise Tatsuka The noise of pure energy being freed echoes as Izuku's X-form, slash completely cutting the robot in half, but also slashing a huge part of the buildings behind them and bursting the whole place and shaking all of UA. The X mark even damages and leaves its mark on a mountain behind UA as Izuku only smiles as the robot falls to the ground destroyed. Everyone looks at the cameras in shock, not knowing how to react to this while Izuku quickly puts his swords back on their sheaths while staying silent as everyone was simply surprised. There were no words from anyone while looking at all this he did on his own, but something happens. Izuku collapses all of a sudden surprising everyone and worrying them as Bakugo, Ida and Shoto don't even think twice to rush towards their friend and assist him as quick as humanly possible as Hatsum and Kendo follow behind after snapping out of the shock. They all rush towards him and make their way to him to hear an insanely heavy breathing coming from Izuku as he looks down to the ground with his smile. From their distance, it was cleared he was exhausted by most likely pushing himself to give it his all in this fight. The only look at the sky to see this attack had so much power he cleaned all clouds nearby, and from what Nizu can see in the satellite he owns cause this rat had to get one after the USJ, he figured out that Izuku's shockwave from his slash actually traveled from Mustafu to Tokyo, and even shaking the ocean from that side. Bakugo, Deku, Izuku, I, I'm alive, don't worry, just having flashbacks to my fights in the red line. He falls back first on the ground as he is fully exhausted and can barely move at all due to strain. Ida. Jeez Midoriya that was insane. He says looking at the destroyed buildings and the mountain with the X mark on it. Shoto. To think there is people stronger than you is hard to believe. Izuku. Why you should? My captain basically destroyed what equaled China in terms of land. Bakugo. Your captain sure is strong then. He says as he goes to help Izuku up. Izuku. Th thanks. He stands up but stumbles to stand still dash. Never mind my red line comment. This is like what happened on Anagashima. Oh I'm so sore. Kendo slash Hatsum. Midoriya. Izuku looks up to both Kendo and Hatsum who suddenly hug him with hints of worry but with a bit too much strength. So much so he hears his back crack and soul leave him as the boys only look at this. Yoichi. From one for all pulling Izuku's soul, you have a mission to complete ninth. Hang in there. Nana. Doing the same come on kid you've gone through worse. Ida. Gee girls I think you are killing him. Bakugo. Don't kill this man yet. He pulls both Kendo and Hatsum away from Izuku who is kind of alive at the moment who catches some air now nerd. What the hell was that all about? Izuku. Full power of my quirk and high concentration of hockey. For the moment I can only handle this state thanks to my full control of my quirk, and I still don't have full control of Conqueror's infusion, so it tires me even more. Using armament condenses my power onto myself and not letting out much from it until I want. He starts to breathe properly and calmly. I based in one my captain's gear abilities, 
To be more precise, Gear Forth, where he expands his rubber body and uses hockey to compress himself and distributes the air for an insane power increase. I call this ability Dawnbringer due to it being based after my captain's many abilities. He says smiling but still tired and clearly noticeable due to his muscles tensing once in a while. Shoto. He really is an inspiration for you, isn't he? Shishishishi. To say he's an inspiration is short. After all, there's no better. Inspiration than the freest man in the world. Bakugo. Oh, that reminds me about what you asked Nizu earlier. HM? About the friends? Bakugo. Yeah. They seemed seriously interested on being here the day you start telling us this stories of yours, nerd. Way do you mean more apart from the two? Bakugo. Izuka Midoriya. Did you forget about the others? Wait, they all work together. Does that mean I'm gonna see my sis again? She will kill you for dying a while ago. I know. He screams while crying for mercy. Bakugo only sighs trying to not laugh for his misfortune, just to get smacked by Izuku who seems angry. Don't you dare. You still have to apologize to her for that. I know but hell will it be funny to see her attack you. Bakugo says getting a bit angry as he needs the back of his head while looking up to Izuku, who to remind you is as tall as Shoji. It won't be you Pomeranian. What did you say you brocoli? Shut it dandelion. You shut your mouth first crybaby. Speaker. Water fountain. Stick of dynamite. Mashed bones. Shut up both of you. Screams Kendo as she smacks both of them hard making their eyes go white from the hit. Why is it the ginger-haired girls who kick our butt so easily? Think both Bakugo and Izuku as they hold their heads in pain. The other three present only have a sweat drop seeing the unexpected and kind of violent reaction from all of them, but in reality, it seems like all of them were enjoying their time. Violent screaming or punching, they all seem to be used to this and don't really mind it as this is what they like to call a good friendship in their eyes. They all start to make their way back to the observation room while talking to each other, as they mostly share their advancements to Izuku and how things had gone in their trainings in this past four months for them just showing to be simple and normal and mostly enjoying this. One may have been gone for a while but with him back, they feel life is only getting better from this point on no matter what. In a certain hospital, a doctor was doing some deep research about some distortions he found in the world not too long ago, not knowing exactly what caused it. It seemed like a completely new matter never registered in the periodic table made it happen only leaving him more confused. He couldn't understand it at all. There was no way to understand what was happening in this site or what even caused it. Not even someone who was there to witness it. But whatever it was is not going around this world like a normal person or without anyone knowing that whatever he or it is, is not from this world. But what could have caused this? Will it be an issue for us in the future or will it be something to join our side? He sighs who am I to know what this is, but whatever is to come next may as well not matter at all. The doctor looks at another screen where it reveals the LOV at the moment making their way to a certain forest not too far from their base, all hoping to find the one thing to help them out in action to defeat this heroes. Without the one for all user here, there is almost no way for his successor to be stopped, but this will work as a lesson to him. Without this power at his mercy, he may still be weak so he better be ready for whatever is to come for him to prove himself worthy of being his successor. Tartarus. He felt off. He felt like he did a mistake ever since he fought against All Might and killed Izuka Midoriya. He didn't know exactly what it was, but he could sense that he made things almost impossible for his successor, that it could cost him his years of planning and it would all go down the gutter. But why? The unpredictable levels of Izuku were ridiculous even for him. So much so that it made him think that calculating the outcome of a fight between both is like having the very best chess players play against one another. All for one couldn't wrap himself around an answer to this question of his, and all he could think was the fact that he killed Izuka Midoriya. Ever since that day, he doesn't know what happened to him that has been telling him one thing. Not only is my end coming, but so is villainy as a whole. He only looks up to the roof of his prison cell as all nearby weapons keep themselves aimed at him and ready to fire. What exactly were you to make me this uneasy? Izuku Midoriya? So, this was the end of part 2 of this series. Stay tuned for next part of this series and if you like this video don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Until next time.